Today on the Broadway Fix, musical theater stars flock to TV land, the drama behind getting Audrey 2 to Broadway, and a chat with Phantom star Ali Ewald. I'm Paul Wontorek, and this is The Broadway Fix for Friday, October 2nd, 2020. On today's show, Caitlin Moynihan is finding out what it's like for Ali Ewalt to sing Phantom inside a shipping container at a drive-in. But first, the news. With Broadway on hold, many theater stars are finding work on TV. That's certainly true on the set of the as-of-yet untitled new musical series on Apple Plus from Saturday Night Live mogul Lorne Michaels. Cecily Strong and Keenan Michael Key are the stars, playing a couple who discover a magical musical town while backpacking. Joining them as townsfolk are... Alan Cumming, Kristen Chenoweth, Jane Krakowski, Aaron Tveit, Ariana DeBose, Anna Harada, Jaime Camille, Fred Armisen, and Dove Cameron. Did I throw enough names at you? Barry Sonnenfeld will direct the series, which is expected in 2021, hopefully with a title. Hamilton Tony winner Renee Elise Goldsberry has also found a musical gig on TV. Girls Forever is the new series starring Sarah Bareilles and produced by Tina Fey and many of the good people from Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, including Fey's husband, Mean Girls composer Jeff Richmond. The show centers on a former girl group who suddenly find fame again when a young rapper samples their one hit. Goldsberry joins the cast as Wiki, the glamorous star of the group. Netflix has announced a premiere date for George C. Wolfe's film version of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. The adaptation of August Wilson's first Broadway play will premiere on Netflix on December 18th. With Viola Davis, Coleman Domingo, Michael Potts, Glenn Turman, and the late Chadwick Boseman in the cast. Ma Rainey's tells the story of a blues singer and her musicians struggling with life in pre-civil rights era America. Like Water for Chocolate is headed to the stage as a new musical. The Laura Esquivel novel, a.k.a. Como Agua para Chocolate, I took Spanish, was previously adapted into a huge hit of a foreign film in 1992 and will now sing with original music from Grammy-winning Latin group La Santa Cecilia with lyrics by Chiara Alegria Jures and a book by Lisa Loomer. Tony winner Michael Mayer will direct this love story set in turn-of-the-century Mexico and fueled by magical realism and really good food. I'm Beth Stevens, and here are your top three to see. Dreaming of your Jet Setter days? Netflix's new series, Emily in Paris, will help cure your travel itch. Starring Tony nominee Ashley Park and Lily Collins as best friends in France, Sex in the City and younger creator Darren Starr's latest binge-worthy show is streaming now. Tomorrow at 4 p.m., Tony nominee Josh Groban is offering an intimate live stream concert event. Josh Groban, Greatest Broadway Songs, will feature the smooth-voiced singer performing a selection of his favorite stage numbers and more. Limited tickets are available, so don't miss out. Visit joshgroban.com slash livestream slash Broadway for more information. Sunday at 8 p.m., Tony nominees Orfe and Andy Carl are putting on a show. As part of the Seth Concert Series, the Broadway power couple joins Seth Rudetsky for a night of chat and song, all taking place on the SethConcertSeries.com. It's time to get homeschooled on the strange and unusual story of how Little Shop of Horrors found its way to Broadway. A rare hit in the horror comedy rock musical genre, the show about, spoiler, a killer plant that terrorizes the innocence of a skid row flower shop, has been an important part of the musical theater canon for 38 years when it first premiered at the tiny WPA theater in Manhattan in 1982. Although it ran five years off-Broadway, became a blockbuster film, and ran all over the world, it amazingly took Little Shop 21 years to make it to Broadway, where it opened 17 years ago today at the Virginia Theater on October 2nd, 2003. But we need to rewind a little bit. You see, there was always a desire to take the show to the big leagues. But Little Shop is a little gem of a musical, and original director and co-author Howard Ashman, who died in 1991, feared the show would lose its heart uptown. So when producers wanted the rights, his estate insisted that Connie Grappo, his original assistant, direct the production. 
a fall 2003 opening was announced with an advance May tryout also scheduled at the very unlikely out of town tryout spot of Coral Gables, Florida. Musical theater stars fought for the roles and some phenomenal talents landed them. Hunter Foster was Seymour, Alice Ripley was Audrey, Billy Porter voiced Audrey too, Reg Rogers played the sadistic dentist, and Lee Wilkoff, the original Seymour off-Broadway and husband of Connie Grappo, graduated to the role of Mr. Mushnick. Then things got messy. Unhappy with the production in Florida, producers brought in veteran director Jerry Zachs to advise. The show was completely overhauled. Zachs replaced Grappo and the entire cast was let go other than Hunter Foster, who put on the glasses and played Seymour on Broadway three months later. Joining him were Carrie Butler as Audrey, Rob Bartlett as Mushnick, Douglas Sills as the dentist, and Michael Leon Woolley as the voice of Audrey too. As a super fan of the show, I'll admit, Little Shop was fun on Broadway, but also a little too slick for its own good. And considering how popular the title is, its run of under 11 months was a major disappointment. The show stays in the news and in the hearts of theater lovers. Original stage and screen Audrey Ellen Green caused a sensation when she returned to the role for a run at City Center Encores in 2015 opposite Jake Gyllenhaal. Film director Greg Berlanti is prepping a new screen version, and the show returned to its roots last year with a scaled-down staging off-Broadway at the Westside Theater. But October 2nd, the day the little show that could turned into something that couldn't, is a big date in the story of Little Shop. Perhaps just as fateful as when Seymour Crowborn saw that weird little plant just sitting there, you know, stuck in among the zinnias. Dadu. Known for being the longest running show on Broadway, The Phantom of the Opera is finding new life at a drive in theater in Astoria, Queens. Radial Park is currently showcasing the filmed production of The Phantom of the Opera at Royal Albert Hall, starring Broadway favorites Sierra Bogus and Ramin Karamloo. But this isn't your normal drive-in movie experience. Phantom alums Ali Ewalt and Derek Davis are accompanying the movie by singing select songs live with an 11-piece orchestra. I got to talk to Ali Ewalt about the exciting hybrid production, the thrill of audience applause, and what those loyal Phantom fans mean to her. Ali, thank you so much for joining us today, joining me. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. Of course. Well. We have to we have to talk about this incredible thing that is happening with you and Phantom. So can you give me a little bit of background, like what is happening in Queens right now at Radial Park? Yes, yes. So um, maybe like a month or so ago, I got a call saying um, this man named Jeremy Shepard has this great idea. He's going to sort of combo um, the movie of Phantom or the, the taped Royal Albert Hall version mm -hmm. and some live performances in an attempt to bring something theatrical and live performancey in a safe way to the people. And so um, he built a drive-in movie theater in Radio Park in Queens. It's overlooking Manhattan. It's this beautiful, mm. beautiful space with this cool warehouse. It's bringing in food trucks and picnic benches. If you don't have a car, mm. you can still go and watch safely from your own picnic bench. And then um, this amer amazing man, Derek Davis, who played Phantom mm. on tour and I are just hopping in and singing a couple of songs while, you know, Sierra Bogus and Ramin are singing up on the screen. Then they kind of mute them for a second and we sing some of the song, some of the show's big numbers. So it's this amazing sort of hybrid theatrical thing. Oh my gosh, I thought it was like you were a pre-show. You, It's like, have, it's really truly a hybrid. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing. I was texting Sierra because we were doing some previews last week and I said, you know, this role of Christine, when you only have to sing Think of Me, Wishing, Point of No Return, is this really sweet gig? I had no idea. I literally had my feet up and was like, thanks for doing all the heavy lifting up there on the screen <laughs> while I'm just relaxing back here. Oh my word. So how, you said you got a call. Is that did you was that the first time you found out about it and you were you heavily involved with the creative process how how did it come about choosing which songs you guys would be singing versus what people are watching on film yeah derek and i were, were definitely part of that discussion particularly because both of us know the show so well and we were able to say you know these are the big numbers he's singing music of the night he sounds glorious um and these are the things that can kind of work with you know christine and the phantom because it's such a sung through show you know we had to find the moments where we could pop in and and sing an aria in there um 
but you know, everything is everything is brand new. We've got an orchestra behind us, so they've learned the music. The conductor is trying to sync our tempos to the tempos in the movie. Um, they're, they figured out how to do, you know, how to film us and put us up on the big drive-in screen. We've got this amazing sound system, but it's really, um, it's really creativity at its finest. It's people just kind of coming together and, and making something work for the first time. How did, what was the rehearsal process like for this? How long did you have to like rehearse with Derek and have the orchestra behind you? It was really fast. We had, um, I think maybe one, no, we had two two orchestra rehearsals so that were super fast. And then we had a tech day when we were standing. So basically um, they built a stage out of some shipping containers. Cause you know, Oh. coronavirus um, creativity <laughs> at its finest. And so we have actually our dressing rooms are made out of shipping containers. The stage itself is sort of hollowed out so, th so that the orchestra can play rain or shine. So they're protected from the elements that way. Mm -hmm. And Derek and I can step back into it as well. Um, but yeah, we had one, one tech and two previews and <laughs> we're kind of just making it work. It's when it comes really in handy to know the show backwards and forwards, you know, at least these songs are thankfully still, still in my body and still in my my muscle memory for sure. What does it feel like for you to be singing these songs again? Because you, your last run in the show, I think was ending in like November, 2018. So it's been almost two years since you played Christine. So what is it like seeing those songs again? It, yeah, it has absolutely been a minute. I have been singing the songs more than I would have expected, mostly because, you know, Phantom of the Opera is this amazing, well-known commodity all over the world. So I've gotten to sing, say, Think of Me in Tokyo or um, different uh, Phantom songs. I did All I Ask of You in Taiwan last year. Um, so at least like those songs are still kind of part of the fabric, but really to do it in the context of the show, it's super interesting to be hearing all of my cues on stage you know playing in the in the film version um and not be rushing to the stage that derek and i have been joking that's been incredibly stressful you're like oh that's my moment oh no 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 no! i can just i don't have to do that part i'm just gonna stay back here no more um, changes <laughs> yeah i just have one one gown on the whole time it's love amazing. it and you don't have to like wade through it. The mist is the, do you have to deal with the mist during the drive-in? The phantom No, mist. there's no, unless, unless it's happening to come from mother nature, there's no, no created mist on stage. All right. You have, I mean, you gotta let people know when there's phantom and mist, I feel like haze, those two just, just go together. Oh my gosh. So I have to know what was it like for you to be preparing to perform in front of a live audience again? I feel like you're one of the, few people uh, the past few weeks, I feel like you've seen a lot more venturing into what does live performance really mean? And I feel like you're one of those people who actually gets to do that during these times. So can you explain a little bit about what went into making sure that this would be safe and, and you know, in the right moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I feel so grateful that I actually get to perform for people, you know, hearing applause live is, it's amazing. It's amazing to know that you're having a direct impact on somebody who's sitting, you know, spaced apart from you, but still in the same world at the same moment, as opposed to, you know, continuing to sing to the, the camera on my phone, which, you know, is great too to make content that way, but um, to get to actually sing for people and to do it, you know, the way that theater is done, which is you perform it once. And if you mess some things up, you just kind of have to keep going. <laughs> You don't get to hit pause on your phone and go back and redo the whole thing. Um, so I definitely, you know, had to make sure that my voice was in shape for all of that. Um, and in the way that, you know, that we were able to keep everybody safe, we have all of our orchestra is wearing masks unless they're playing wind instruments and they are spaced off. And then Derek and I are both facing forward. We never get close to each other or to the conductor who's also wearing a mask. And then our audience um, is all spaced apart. They have temperature checks, they're mask required. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously if you come and you can sit in your own car, then you're you know protected in your nice safe little bubble and you can hear the music over your radio and you can kind of just watch this this amazing thing. So they have taken um, you know great great measures to make sure that, that everybody, everybody Everybody is safe, um, and that we're not we're not spreading anything. But also that we get to have this amazing communal experience, which I know that I personally have have sorely needed during mm -hmm. this time. Yeah, for you as an artist, what did that 
first preview performance mean to you to hear that applause, to know that people were hearing your voice live and you could feel their energy? What did that mean for you as an artist? Oh, it was so it was so special. I mean, even the first the first rehearsal, you know, getting to hear Derek in person and to hear this band playing and to look at a conductor and you know, we are in in real time where we are collaborating together where we're performing mm. this thing together. Um just meant the world to me. I honestly am just so so grateful. My parents came to the second preview and they're planning to come again and again and again and again and I think you know, for them to get to watch me perform live in this beautiful new venue and mm -hmm. and kind of creating this new art form, I think that, you know, theater right now has to exist in different ways. And I'm, I'm just so, so thankful that there are people who care and are trying to innovate right now and, and really give us all this gift of um, being able to have these these great experiences together and to share empathy and joy and um, and happiness and emotion. You know, I'm singing Wishing You Were Somehow Here Again, which of course is incredibly um, relevant and cathartic during this time. And I know that we've all experienced loss on so many different levels right mm -hmm. now. And so that kind of gives a whole new meaning to the song to me and I imagine to the people who are listening to it as well. Beautiful. And I love the idea that it is, it's essentially live performance mixed with live performance. And that, you know, it's not, we love the movie, obviously Phantom to the Opera, but because it's a filmed stage performance combined with an actual live performance, do you feel like there's some magic in that? And do you think this could potentially be the, like, could you see more of the, these hybrids happening? Is what I'm asking. I mean, I think certainly during this time, I know that Radio Park for sure is hoping to have sort of a number of these kinds of things. They're talking about doing Purple Rain. I'm sure they'll think of some other um, some other performances. And I just love that you know that 25th anniversary cast obviously is so incredible. They did such a wonderful job filming in and as you said capturing this element of live performance but also in a way that's really grand and beautiful and translates so well um, over a movie screen and I think really you know they were they were very much ahead of their time in that way we've seen obviously how getting to watch Hamilton from our homes has been this amazing transformative experience right so um, if we can continue to do to do things like that and to um, to have that that element of like right here and now you know you are hearing me sing think of me <laughs> and anything could happen in this moment but also to get the grand sort of theatricality of it as a combination I think is a really is a really great way to experience theater right now mm -hmm. what do you say to uh like theater your theater family right now like how are you feeling it's been a long six months 200 and something days now since, since broadway closed so how um you know how were those six months for you and how are you feeling now that you get to you know kind of do broadway again i mean it's been it's been really tough it's tough you know i think the asset of being a professional performer and having been one for a long time is that we sort of are used to sitting with this uncertainty, not on the scale of a you know global pandemic that obviously has never happened before and hopefully won't again, knock on wood. Um, but, um, but I do sort of understand how to be unemployed. It's just looking down the road and, and not knowing, you know, what's in our future. And I think that having something like this and getting to watch, you know, I've seen like little pockets of, of live performance from some of my friends on social media, you know, performing outdoors all over the country. I think that gives all of us some hope that, you know, there there is a future for us. It might not be right away. It might not be physically in Broadway theaters right away, but there is a way for us to continue to work on our craft and to give our gifts to our audiences and to sort of feel feel that love in return. And I think that, um, that I think there's something really, really special about sort of generating that feeling and letting other people see that there, there are possibilities out there and, um, and people need art. I mean, I think that's fairly obvious to us, <laughs> to those of us that are artists. But I think, you know, in this time, what's what's hard is that we, in some ways, have been labeled inessential, even though, you know, everybody's sitting at home watching Netflix and reading books and listening to music and doing all these things to help us through this really difficult time. Um, and so it's nice to feel in real life, in, in person, you know, that love back from an audience saying, you know, you do 
help during this time. You do make things better. You do help us to feel things. Um, and so we just gotta <laughs> take it one day at a time, I think, honestly. Definitely. And you have such a long history with Phantom of the Opera, obviously. So it was always such a joy and an honor to be part of the Phantom of the Opera family, with a PH, if you will, the family. Uh, family. Does it feel different? Do you feel, does it feel different now after, like, after this time of quarantine and being able to be a part of this experience? It, yeah, it's it's even more special, I think, to be part of the part of the family. My first preview, actually, I had um, my friend Carly, who is one of our ballerinas on Broadway. She came with her husband. They live in Astoria, really close by, and she was telling me that you know the overture started, and she started to cry because they're so you know mm -hmm. everybody's missing this right now, is missing the feeling the feeling of community. Um, but it also you know brought her so much joy to get to see something um, that felt like you know the the family. That, that we all had had created and I think that you know that now thank thank goodness for the internet that we've all been able to sort of connect and support each other this way you know I think that most of my friendships have really deepened during this time because I I need that sense of connection so badly and my friends have been so amazingly supportive and I hope that I've been the same for them and so and I think that's absolutely true of the of the Phantom family both the you know the cast and crew and everybody at the theater and the greater the greater fandom I was amazed our first performance um there we had um some fans that I knew some fans that I didn't um one woman came wearing a full it was a full regalia she had this awesome I think it was like a My Little Pony Phantom sweatshirt she had leggings that were in the pattern of the blue wishing dress um to the whole thing and it was so cool um but you know i think that people really really miss um phantom and broadway in particular and i love that you know that they've been able to to have an outlet for that and and to have something to look forward to and, and something to see oh, oh my gosh i love that now ali what if you can can you tell me one thing that has brought you joy in the past six months? Oh, well, that's that's a little easy because she's sitting right next to me. Ta-da! Oh my gosh. Hi, Val. She is probably like the best giver of joy um, that I've had. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing with her arm right there. She's ready for the camera. She's, she's ready. ready. She says hello. She's like, Mom, I was napping. I'm not sure why you just spoke No, I mean, I don't know. Just just pets pets during this time. They are they are happy. She's so happy that I'm home. She's oh like, This is this is the greatest thing. You you stay with me all day long. I get like four walks and then I get all the attention. But she definitely has brought me joy. I love it. And how long is this running for? Uh, we are running through October 11th. What's been amazing too is how much Radial Park has done um, a great job with integrating with the community that's close by, making sure that they employ people who live nearby to sell concessions, to be part of the security team and, and all of that stuff. And I think they're really um, also making a concerted effort to bring music and musical theater to people that don't necessarily always have access to mm -hmm. it. So added added bonus to you know me getting to sing songs that I love. Please be sure to go check out the Phantom of the Opera drive-in experience happening at Radio Park. And you can hear Miss Ali Ewalt sing Phantom of the Opera once again. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hope you got your Broadway fix. We'll be back with new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday starting October 12th. Have a fantastic weekend.